Josh Hader, one of the most dominant closers of all time, is on his way to the San Diego Padres. The Yankees give up a giant package for two pitchers, and Trey Mancini is no longer an Oriole. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked On MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, baseball writer for Sports Illustrated. Thank you for making this your first listen every single day. And we got to start with the big news, Josh Hader moving from the Milwaukee Brewers to the San Diego Padres in a package for four total players. And I'm going to get into the prospects in a second. That's what we do here. But first, just want to acknowledge how wild it is that Josh Hader uh, was traded. So four-time All-Star, leads MLB in saves right now with 29. But I don't necessarily think everybody realizes how dominant he is. Mariano Rivera is arguably the greatest reliever of all time. Josh Hader statistically is one of, if not the most dominant reliever of all time. So of all relievers who have thrown 300 or more innings, he's number one all time in, K- in strikeouts per nine innings, in hits per nine innings, and wa- and whip. Um, he has allowed 24 runs over the last 97 appearances covering two seasons and that's with having a bad July that he's had so wild that Josh Hader is getting moved but the package that he got moved for is really interesting so the Padres are sending back their own closer left-hand pitcher Taylor Rogers and I think that this is something where Rogers can be fixed right he got demoted out of the role recently he made a change this year to implement a little more of a sweep to his slider. So he gave up a little bit of velocity for movement. It's about three or four mile an hour slower, and it gets hit harder. And I think that's something the Brewers can fix. In the meantime, the Brewers still have Devin Williams. So you have Devin Williams and Taylor Rogers there. Uh, You're also getting right-hand pitcher Denilson Lamette. Good pitcher when he's healthy. But to go along with that, you've got two prospects. You've got left-hand pitcher Robert Gasser, And you've got outfielder Estiri Ruiz. So, Gasser, second round pick last year out of Houston. Top 10 prospect in this system. Doing decent in high A Fort Wayne. Solid, not amazing. Uh, 418 ERA, 90 innings, 28 walks to 115 strikeouts. Uh, Win-loss record's 4-9, but that doesn't necessarily always matter at the lower levels. So, fastball. For a lefty, really good velo, sits 93, can touch 95 with it. He's got a, uh, a cutter to go along with that that sits around 90, 91. Uh, really good weapon against righties. He's got a big breaking ball. It's a good third pitch for him, I think. Has a change up. He throws a little too often. Needs to get rid of it. It's below average. Righties particularly seem to crush it, but can throw strikes. Good feel for pitching. I feel like... The projection's a number four. I think you can make him into a number three, especially in this system with how they can develop pitchers. I mean, look at the list of some of these pitchers you've gotten, you know, in this system with Brandon Woodruff and Eric Lauer or Corbin Burns. You can make good pitchers here. So I feel like they can make Gasser into a number three versus a number four. And to, to go along with that, Asturi Ruiz, um, one of the probably biggest helium prospects of anybody this year uh, wasn't protected from the rule five draft last year absolute huge breakout this year cut his chase rate um, you know stop swinging it just junk outside of the zone stop being super aggressive found the power so he hit 333 467 560 between double a AA and triple a 13 home runs career high 60 stolen bases 46 rbis um, we knew he had plus raw power It just wasn't necessarily manifesting in games. Um, And then we knew he had speed. Really, you know, really good athlete. Um, Defensively, wasn't able to to make it work in the infield. The hands weren't good enough, and so he's been in the outfield. He's going to get better with time in the outfield. But absolutely, if the strike zone discipline holds, if this pitch selection holds, he's absolutely going to be an everyday player who can make an impact both with his speed and his power. 
So you get those four players for a year and a half of Josh Hader. And I really think from the Brewers' perspective, this was about money, right? So Josh Hader's making $11 million this year. He's projected to make $16 million next year. But uh, the Brewers' salary this year is already $131 million. And I think they know they can't pay him long-term. And so you can move him next year at the trade deadline as a rental. You can move him in the offseason to get a full season out of him. You can uh, let him leave in free agency, hope the qualifying offer still exists to get a draft pick in compensation, or you can trade him now. And I think this is something where, I don't know if they saw the July struggles and were worried that that was going to manifest as something bigger, or if they just wanted to maximize the return they could get by selling him now, but they went ahead and moved him now. So Padres get the guy they've been chasing for years, uh, and, you know, ship out their own closer. Brewers have uh, Taylor Rogers that they can work with. They can put him in a setup role. They've got Devin Williams, who's been absolutely fantastic uh, as the setup guy to Hater. He can now be the closer with his airbender. And in the meantime, the Padres have that back of the bullpen guy they've been wanting for a long time. Uh, another really interesting trade today is the Yankees go to Oakland and get two guys. They get starter Frankie Montes and closer Lou, Lou Trevino. And this is after they got Andrew Benatendi and they got uh, reliever Scott Efros from the Cubs. So Montes, one of the best starters available on the market, um, has another year of control. So you get him for two, for two pennant races. And the thing with him is he was a top six finisher in the Cy Young last year. Uh, his stuff's the exact same this year. One of the best chase rates in the league. He's he's um, and it's something where like you have to imagine having a better defense behind him, having a better offense to give him run support. He's going to look even better, provided the mental stuff translates to New York. That's always the question. Shout out Joey Gallo. And the package that went back for this, so Montes Trevino, but back to the Yankees, four guys. Um, left-hand pitcher Ken Waldachuk, right-hand pitcher Luis Medina, left-hand pitcher J.P. Sears, and second baseman Cooper Bowman. So I've talked about Waldachuk on here quite a few times. Fifth-round pick in 2019 out of St. Mary's, and St. Mary's is starting to look like they can produce some dang pitchers. So high-end double-A last year, and then this year, um, <clears throat> sorry, then this year triple-A, uh, sorry, double A to triple A. So double A, six games, one to six ERA, 28 innings, 46 strikeouts to 10 walks. Moves up to triple A, 11 games in triple A, 359 ERA, 47 and two thirds innings, 70 strikeouts to 23 walks. And the thing about Waldachuk here, and there's a little bit of variance in the projection, right? So I look at him and I see super funky delivery. Um, you know, absolutely kind of kind of wild, but he's got mid-90s fastball, a lot of movement to it. He's got a, you know, a low 80s slider. He's got an above average changeup. He's got kind of a slurvy curveball. And I'm thinking, okay, this is a dude. He's going to get swing and misses on that slider. He's going to put the fastball up in the zone. A lefty throw in 96 is a hard thing to deal with. Not a lot of guys see that kind of velo out of a lefty. Um, change up's going to keep you honest, 80 to 84. And I think, okay, you're looking at, you know, what, a number three, number four starter. There's some folks who see the lower half kind of come unsynced in delivery and his command not being super tight and think he's going to be a bullpen arm, a high leverage reliever. Either way, still a great acquisition for Oakland in the highlight of this package. Going along with that, Luis Medina, uh, right-hand pitcher, some of the best pure stuff in this organization, right? So, um, fastball averages 97. He's hit 102 with it before. He's got a hammer curveball in the low 80s. He's got a changeup that's high 80s. He added a slider this year. He got a lot more consistent with the delivery as well. Um, I think if he if he finishes that building the consistency, 
you're looking at a front end of the rotation guy. But as of right now, mid, you know, number three or so, because that consistency is not always there. And so the command and, and the control struggle a bit. Control is better than the command is. Um, when he's on, he's practically untouchable. The stuff is there. When he's not on, that's when you have issues with high pitch counts and he walks guys and things like that. I think that this is something where he's probably going to slot in the rotation close to right away. And you're going to have a chance to do some stuff with him. J.P. Sears, right-hand pitcher, uh, actually was a, acquired by the Yankees from the Mariners in 2017. Had a breakout last year. 136 strikeouts. Top five in the system on that. Uh, debuted this year. Kind of see him as... They've kind of used him in that long relief role. I think you could have him as a back-end starter. He's got a four-seamer in the low 90s. He's got a low 80s slider, a mid-80s changeup. Um, they keep having him go back and forth between AAA and the majors. I expect him to slot in the rotation right away and be a starter probably soon as next week for Oakland and get a chance to figure it out on the job. And then Cooper Bowman, 2021 fourth rounder out of Louisville. Um probably second baseman, hit tools below average. I think he's got decent power. He's got plus speed. When he makes contact with it, he can beat the ball to the bag. It's just a matter of making contact. Um, a good piece to work with, organizational depth. You need things like that. And somebody that they can absolutely work on trying to improve the contact tool. In just a minute, I want to get into some of the hitting moves that have been made, as well as some of the guys who are still left. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Built Bar. If you have not tried Built Puffs yet, you are missing out on one of life's greatest joys. And there's a new flavor. It's cookie dough covered in chocolate. Built has done it again. So cookie dough chunk puffs have a light and chewy texture, real cookie dough chunks, and they're covered in 100% real chocolate. It's the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it and without the extra calories. Cookie dough chunk puffs are 160 calories. That's it. And they have 15 grams of protein. So go to Built.com, snag a box for yourself and one for the whole family. Because that is the perfect treat. And if you just want to find a great hiding place in your house and like hoard them for yourself, I get it. I've been doing that at my own house with my family. So I understand completely. You're going to love the cookie dough chunk puff. So go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 at Built.com. Okay, three-way trade today. Absolutely wild. I feel like we don't see a ton of these. So, three-way trade, and what happens here is Trey Mancini goes from the Orioles to the Astros. The Astros also get... Um, yeah, the, 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 the Astros also get right-hand pitcher Jaden Murray from the Tampa Bay Rays. Um... The, the, the Rays get Astro center fielder Jose Siri. The Orioles get two prospects, right-hand pitcher Seth Johnson from the Rays and right-hand pitcher Chase McDermott from the Astros. So Johnson's kind of the star of the trade when it comes to the prospects. Um, Siri and Mancini are obviously the bigger names. And trading Mancini is something that had to be tough. Um... Kind of, he's a leader in the clubhouse in Baltimore. You, you remember, I think it's 2020. He had stage three colon cancer. Obviously missed the whole season. Came back and made a return to baseball last year. Plays first base as a DH. Can play corner outfield in a worst case scenario kind of thing. But absolutely beloved player in Baltimore. Uh, was probably very emotional with that trade and just just didn't know if they would do it. Kind of surprised that it actually happened. Uh, Jose, Jose Siri going over to the Rays. Obviously, he's there to plug in for center field now that Kevin Kiermeyer's on the injured list, going to end his season. Um, only 27, second year in the majors. Uh, has good defense. I think he's got seven outs above average, eight defensive runs saved this inning or this season in center field. Brett Phillips was, uh, was waived to a DFA to make room for Siri. Uh, and the question for Siri is the offense. He's just got to kind of figure out offensively what he's doing there. But the prospects. So Johnson is the best prospect to me here. Number 40 pick in the 2019 draft. Rays were pretty cautious with him. Um, slider's been getting better. Fastball's really good fastball. So 
was was looking pretty good and then got hurt in late May's having Tommy John surgery. And I'm guessing that's why there was a second prospect going back to Baltimore in this. Chase McDermott, uh, fourth rounder out of Ball State last year. ERA's not great, 550 in 19 games in high A, but if you look at some of the other stats, 114 strikeouts in 72 innings. Uh, wins and losses at the minor league level, especially the lower minors, are virtually meaningless. I was talking to a kid in rookie ball yesterday, um, and he's allowed 15 runs this season, and like five were earned. Wins and losses in the lower minors are meaningless. ERA can tell you something, but isn't the entire story. So, 550 ERA, I'd rather look at look look at the pitches. I'd rather look at um, some of the peripheral stats versus just relying on ERA and a win-loss record to tell me how he's doing um, in high A. But I definitely think there's some potential here. And it's going to come down to command and control the secondaries. Kind of one of the common refrains you hear about these young pitchers is you got to have the, the command and control of the secondaries. Uh, the Astros also get Jaden Murray in this to go along with Trey Mancini. So 2019 draftee of the Rays went high A, double A in 2021 because you lost 2020. Uh, 2022 started off in double A, struggled a little bit, put it together mid-July. Had six straight starts where he had a 32 and two-thirds innings across these six starts. Six total earned runs. Batting average a lot of like 181. Briefly went to triple A. Uh, went back to double A, you know, just kind of moving guys around the org. That happens sometimes. Guys go up and back down. That's fine. Um, definitely think there's some potential here for the Astros to uncover a back into the rotation guy um, in exchange for a center fielder that offensively wasn't necessarily working out for them. Get a little bit better pop from the DH role and, uh, you know, first baseman. So uh, to go along with that, a couple of their trades, a couple of catchers moved around. Nobody, uh, Christian Vasquez, I think, was the big one. Um, Tommy Pham moves from the Rays to the Red Sox for a player to be named later. And all apologies to Lauren, our host of Locked On Red Sox. I don't really know what the Red Sox are doing at this trade deadline. I don't really understand. They've sent some guys out. They've um, brought some guys in. It just kind of seems to be like uh, shuffling the uh, shuffling the the deck chairs on the Titanic. I mean, you you have a guy. In your, um, you have a guy in your hitting and pitching meetings. You're discussing how you're going to attack the Astros for three games, three games that you need to win because you are in what third place, fourth place. No, I'm sorry, you're, you're you're fifth place in the East. So weird to think about the Red Sox being in fifth place. They were in the playoffs last year. Uh, yeah, you're in fifth place in the East, and. You give a guy all your secrets. Here's how we're going to attack all these Astro batters. And then you trade the guy to the Astros so they know what you're trying to do. And um, it is 922 Eastern on Monday night. And uh, the Astros right now are beating the Red Sox 2-1. to one. So take that for what you will. But when you look past that, there's a couple big questions now about the trade deadline, about guys are going to move and who's available. Um. We're going to get to that in just a second. YouTube, just us right now. The audio folks are listening to ads. Uh, what I want to do is I want to say, one, thank you for being here. If you do us a favor and like and subscribe, it really does help the show out a ton. Um, outside of that, if you have questions, we do mailbags every single Monday. So uh, the entire show on Mondays is questions from listeners. So... Drop it in the comments here. Just tell me, hey, this is a this is the mailbag question for Monday. We'll get to it on Monday. Or you can email us, prospects at gmail.com. Or you can tweet. I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. The show is on Twitter at Locked On Farm. Either one of those would work as well. We would love to um, we would love to take your questions on the show uh, and put you into our mailbag. A couple big questions remaining as we head up to the trade deadline, which is this afternoon. Um, number one, Soto and Otani. Uh, reports from Monday are that the Angels aren't thrilled with the offers they've received for Shohei Otani, and they're planning on keeping Shohei Otani. That's fine. Um, again, timestamps as of 925 
on Monday night, we have not heard about a Juan Soto trade. I, and I've said this for a while, I think that if Juan Soto gets traded, it's going to be in the offseason. I think a trade of this size, with this many moving pieces, uh, the Nationals want top prospects, they want MLB ready, or already in MLB controllable talent. It is hard if you are a contender to go out and get Juan Soto and still contend this season. So I think what's most likely is in the offseason, you have a bigger market because there's less teams worried about, well, if I give up this piece, it's going to hurt us on the stretch run because you have a chance to sign a free agent, you know, recruit somebody to come play around Juan Soto. So I think that's going to happen in the offseason. Um, so you kind of look at some of the hitters who's left on the board. I think some of the biggest names as far as hitters, uh, you've got catcher w- uh, Wilson Contreras of the Cubs, who's almost guaranteed to get moved. You've got first baseman Josh Bell of the Nationals, virtually guaranteed to get moved. And then some guys that may or may not get moved, but some outfielders, Ian Happ, also of the Cubs, may or may not get moved. Ben Gamble of the Pirates, heard a little bit about him, was one of those platoon or corner guys. And then Jock Peterson of the Giants. Here's what I want to happen. If Jock Peterson gets traded and the team he goes to wins the World Series. He will be the first player in baseball history to spend, to go to three consecutive World Series on different teams and win all three. So I think if if your team, like if whatever team trades for Jock Peterson, that may be the favorite to win the World Series, just based on that stat alone. The last two teams Jock Peterson has joined uh, have won the World Series. So I love that stat. I think it's a fantastic stat. But speaking of the Dodgers, I think one of the big questions here is what do the Dodgers do? The Dodgers have a ton of farm talent. They can go out. They have the farm talent to trade for anybody up to and including Juan Soto. They've got, you know, you look at, they've got five players in the top 100. Catcher Diego Cartaya, third baseman Miguel Vargas. Bobby Miller, the righty, Ryan Pipo, the righty. I think I said that right. Somebody corrected me last time. Uh, second baseman, Michael Bush. And then I'm high on outfielder Andy Pages, the uh, the Cuban import. And I had Andy Pages going to the Reds in a Luis Castillo deal before the Mariners came in. Uh, from what I heard, the Dodgers have struck out on Castillo. They've now struck out on Montes. So I can see them making a splash with all of these prospects they have. Um. And so I, I think they're the biggest unknown as of right now is what do the Dodgers do? They can dictate the rest of this entire trade deadline. And then to go along with that, you talk about the trade deadline is the arms. So there's a lot of like starting pitcher wise. Yes, Otani's not going. Montes has already been moved. But there are good pitchers out there if they get moved. If the Giants want to make a deal, Carlos Rodon is the best starting pitcher on the market. Presumed to be a rental. Um, 11.6 strikeouts per nine. League leading 229 FIP. ERA's three. He's been worth like three and a half war. I mean, if they move him, he's the most attractive. And I could see Rodon going to the Dodgers. I don't know if they'd trade him to the Dodgers, but that would be wild if that happened. Uh, Tarek Scooball of the Tigers. Tigers said they'd listen to anybody. Uh, Pablo Lopez of the Mar- of the Marlins, another guy who you might see get moved. Tyler Molly of the Reds, I don't expect them to keep him. There's no reason for them to keep him. Um, you've got team control through next season, so a little bit longer there, but I can see him getting moved as well. And then when you look at some of the relievers, um, Scott Barlow of the Royals, David Bednar of the Pirates, Gregory Soto of the Tigers. Uh, big one, I think, is David Robertson of the Cubs. Most likely to get traded. Um, candidate for comeback player of the year, 14 saves, 223 ERA in 40 innings. I mean, seems like he would work out pretty well. So lots of guys that could get moved still. Um, but again, I think I think some of the big uh, some of the big outstanding things, the Dodgers, what are they going to do? Feels like the Braves are going to work on an outfielder after losing Adam Duvall. Speaking of the Braves, they just signed Austin Riley to a $212 million deal over 10 years. Nothing leaks out of that Braves front office. Alex Anthopoulos runs a very tight ship. Um, 
And then what else do the Yankees do? The Yankees went out and got Ben Attendee. The Yankees went out and got Frankie Montes and Lou Trevino. But they did all that. They kept their top prospects. They kept Dominguez. They kept Volpe. They kept Peraza. Just like when the Padres made their trade. They kept Mackenzie Gore. They kept C.J. Abrams. They kept Robert Hassel. They kept James Wood and Jackson Merrill. So if Soto is going to get moved, those teams have the guys to do it. Um, but the Yankees did a really good job of improving their team and still keeping their top prospects. Now, their AAA rotation got absolutely decimated, but I don't think they care because the goal is to win a World Series, not to win um, not to win the International League. Crazy week coming up. We're going to be part of the MLB Trade Deadline Show live. That is at 5.30 Eastern Time today, Tuesday. Uh, go to the Locked on MLB feed. You'll find it. I'll be hopping on there to talk about prospects. We're going to recap the trade deadline for you um, and just have a great week coming up. A reminder, mailbag next Monday. If you have questions for the show, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. The show's on Twitter at Locked On Farm. Or you can email us, LockedOnMLBProspects at gmail.com. Until we talk then, this has been Locked On MLB Prospects. Uh-huh.